It's really good to be with you all here at First Baptist, and uh, it's really a, a privilege. My name is Rob Wertheim, and I'm with the Jews for Jesus. And this morning, I've come to share a special presentation with you called Christ in the Passover. Now, ask some Jewish boys or girls who the hero of Passover is. And after giving credit to the Lord, they'll certainly tell you Moses. And that's true, but that's not the whole truth. You see, if you ask some Jewish boys or girls who know the Messiah that same question, then they'll tell you Jesus. Now, perhaps you're wondering, what's Jesus got to do with Passover? Passover is Jewish. Well, so is Jesus. And not only did he celebrate Passover every year while he dwelt among us on the earth, but I think he's clearly pictured in all the symbols of Passover and in the story of Passover itself. For the message of Passover is a promise of redemption. And the story of Passover is a story of our liberation from bondage. So this morning, as I explain this traditional Passover setting, it's my hope that you'll see it as more than just an explanation of a commemorative meal, but that you'll view it as I view it, as an object lesson of the life and mission of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now look closely, because I believe you'll see a picture of his death, his resurrection, and the promise of his return. And if you have a Bible with you, I'd like you to turn with me, if you would, right now, to the Gospel of Luke, and we'll be looking at verse 20, chapter 22, beginning in verse 7. That's the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22, beginning in verse 7. <clears throat> And we read, Then came the day of unleavened bread upon which the Passover lamb must be killed. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare us a Passover that we may eat. And then reading down in verse 13, And they went and found as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. The first night of Passover begins a seven-day holiday called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And during this time, we eat nothing containing any leaven or yeast. Why no leaven? Well, throughout Scripture, leaven is frequently used as a symbol of sin. And in olden times, a small piece of leaven was used to ferment an entire portion of dough. It was the leaven that caused the dough to rise, to become puffed up, just as sin causes each one of us to become puffed up in our own eyes. So during this time, we eat no leaven as a way of saying that we want to break the daily sin cycle in our own lives. That's why in some Orthodox Jewish homes, for six weeks prior to Passover, the house undergoes a complete spring cleaning. We remove all of the cakes, the cookies, the bread, the cereal, the baking soda, anything containing any leaven in it. Now, this is usually the work of the woman of the house. But did you notice... Luke says that Jesus sent two men to prepare the Passover. Perhaps he sent two men because in Judaism, it's the man who has standing before God. Not only when it comes to praying, but when it comes to ceremonial preparations as well. So if you think about it, that must mean the man should be doing the cleaning during these six weeks. Now hold on just a second. There's got to be a loophole in here somewhere. Let's see now. Ah, I remember now. The rabbis have come up with a terrific solution to the problem. They explain, now true, the house is spotless because the woman has spent the last six weeks cleaning and removing every speck of leaven. Well, almost every speck, that is. You see, she's taken a few crumbs and she's carefully hidden them somewhere in the house and it's up to the man to find them. So, the night before Passover, he returns home and takes up some rather strange-looking cleaning tools. <clears throat> they include a napkin, a wooden spoon, and a feather. And he goes on what we call Benikat Chametz, the search for the living. Now, where could those crumbs be? Anywhere. Up in the attic, down in the basement, behind the refrigerator, anywhere. But fortunately for the man, she's been good enough to hide them in the exact same place as the year before. 
and the year before that, and the year before that. So finally, he discovers the crumbs, and with a very steady hand, he sweeps the crumbs into the spoon with a feather. Now, ladies, this is what I call a heavy house cleaning. Since the crumbs represent sin, he isn't allowed to touch them. So instead, he wraps them in a napkin, and he takes them down to a large bonfire, burning in the courtyard of the synagogue, where all the men of the congregation have gathered to throw their bundle of leaven into the flames. Then he returns home, where he proudly proclaims, Now I have purged my house of all leaven. But just to be certain, he adds, May all manner of leaven which I have neither seen nor removed be considered null and void and is the dust of the earth. Amen. The house has been cleansed. The home is now ready for the Passover celebration. Our ancestors were instructed to eat the Passover meal with their loins girded, with their sandals on their feet, and with their staves in their hands ready to go at a moment's notice. But today, today we relax and recline on pillows. You see, in Middle Eastern tradition, only the free could recline at dinner. Only the redeemed. And at Passover, the head of the house puts on special ceremonial garments. He'll wear a white robe called a kittle, because in Jewish tradition, white is the color of royalty. And Jewish men often cover their heads as a sign of respect before God. But tonight, instead of wearing the usual yarmulke or skullcap, he'll wear something a bit more elaborate. He'll wear a mitre. Royal robes and the symbol of a crown because the head of Passover is a king. And as king, he guides his family through the traditional Passover Seder. Seder is a Hebrew word meaning order because the Passover celebration follows a specific order of service. And that order is recorded here in this book, which is called An Haggadah, which means the telling. <clears throat> well, I say everything's about ready. Oh, there's a customary greeting at Passover, which goes like this. Let all who are hungry come and eat. Don't get excited. I'm not going to serve you the traditional Passover meal. But the invitation stands. Come and join me as we celebrate Passover together. Passover begins with the lighting of the candles. And this is usually the duty and honor of the woman of the house. And I'm going to ask my wife, Sandy, if she'd come up right now and light the candles for us. Amen. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us by his commandments and commanded us to light the Passover light. Thanks. It's very fitting that a woman kindles these lights, for it reminds me that the Messiah... The light of the world would come not from the seed of man, but by the seed of woman and by the will of God. For as the prophet Isaiah foretold, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and she shall call his name Emmanuel, a light to light the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. Passover isn't just a meal, but it's a banquet. And it's not just a service, but a ceremony. And while a meal and service might just take one or two hours, the Passover celebration might take up to four hours. And during this time, each adult will drink from his cup and refill it four times. The first cup is the Kiddush cup, or the cup of sanctification. Then comes the cup of plagues. And then the third cup, the cup of redemption. 
This cup is actually the focal point of the entire evening. And then comes the fourth cup, the cup of Hallel, or the cup of praise. <clears throat> but it's the first cup, the cup, the Kiddush cup, the cup of sanctification, in which the host of the uh, evening offers a blessing. Holding his Kiddush cup aloft, he offers praise and thanks to God Almighty, King of the universe, who has created the fruit of the vine. Baruch Eloheinu melech olam, Borei pari hagafen, Amen. The service has begun, and the youngest person present comes forward to ask the meaning of Passover. He or she recites the traditional four questions found in the Haggadah. They're chanted, and the first one goes like this. Which means, why is this night different from all other nights? And those of us who know the story of Passover are obligated to respond. This is because of what the Lord did for me, when he brought me out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, when he redeemed me with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Redemption. It's the very heart of Passover. But Passover imparts not only God's message of redemption, it imparts God's means of redemption through the sacrifice of a Passover lamb. Our ancestors were instructed to take a spotless lamb, to roast it whole without breaking any of its bones, and to apply its blood to the doorposts of our homes. First to the top of the door, the lintel, and then to the two side posts. And because of our obedience to God's command, and because of our faith in the effectiveness of his provision, we were spared the ravages of the 10th plague to befall the land of Egypt. For when the angel of death saw the blood on our doors, death was forced to pass over. That's where we get the name Passover. And in Hebrew, Pesach, the holiday which commemorates the time when death passed over the houses of Israel because of the blood the blood of the lamb, the Passover lamb. What a mighty act of redemption. But what a picture of an even greater redemption through the sacrifice of another Passover lamb, the Messiah, Jesus. For just as none of the bones of those first Passover lambs were broke, so none of Jesus' bones were broken in his death. And just as our ancestors had to apply in faith the blood of the lamb to the doorposts of their homes, so each one of us must apply the blood of the Messiah to the doorposts of our hearts. I don't think it was a coincidence that when the blood of the lamb dripped down from the top of the door, it formed the sign of a cross. And then the child asks another question. Why on this night do we eat only unleavened bread? And we explain. Our ancestors, in their haste to leave Egypt, had to take their bread with them while it was still flat. And one of the items found on the Passover table is this one called a matzotash. And inside it are three layers of unleavened bread, each one separated from the others by some cloth. The head of the house removes the middle layer. <clears throat> he recites a blessing and then breaks it in two. He sets one half aside while the other half he gives a special name to. It's called the afikomen. Now, I'd like you to all try saying that word with me together, okay? Are you ready? Afikomen. Let's try it one more time for good measure. Ready? Afikomen. Very good. You all speak Greek. It's not a Hebrew word, by the way. It's a Greek word, which means that which comes later. So that's precisely what happens. The afikomen isn't eaten yet. It comes later. But for now, it's wrapped in a white cloth and hidden from view, buried. No one else at the table knows where it's been hidden, but later on, some will have to find it, or else the service cannot be concluded. And then the child asks two more questions. Why on this night do we eat only bitter herbs, and why do we dip the sop, 
into the salt water. Well, let me explain by showing you this. <clears throat> this is a Seder plate. And despite its appearance, it's not used for deviled eggs. A symbolic piece of food from the Passover service is placed into each one of these compartments. And all of these symbols are part of the picture of redemption. The first item is karpas, or greens. And we usually use parsley or lettuce. These greens represent life. But before we eat them, we're supposed to dip them into salt water, which represents the tears of life. So by dipping, we're reminded that a life without redemption is a life immersed in tears. And this is a chazeret. It's a root of a bitter herb, and we generally use an onion or a horseradish root. This symbol reminds us that the root of life is bitter, as it certainly was for our ancestors in Egypt. And this is maror, the bitter herb itself, freshly ground horseradish. Now, we're supposed to eat about a tablespoonful of horseradish. Do you know what happens when you eat a tablespoonful of horseradish? You cry. You have little choice in the matter because this is between the horseradish and your sinuses. And the horseradish always wins. And like the chazeret, the moror reminds us of how bitter life is without redemption. We call this Jewish wasabi. <laughs> and by way of contrast with the haroset, which represents the mortar which our ancestors used to make bricks for Pharaoh. It's made up of chopped apples, nuts, raisins, honey, and it tastes delicious. Now, perhaps you're wondering why such a sweet mixture is used to represent such bitter toil. Well, don't worry. Our rabbis explain that even the bitterest of labor is sweetened with a promise of redemption. And this is not an Easter egg. This is a chagiga. The Chagiga was a name given to the special temple sacrifice in Jerusalem. We roast the egg, and that turns it brown. The Chagiga is a token of grief to our people, grief over the destruction of the second temple. And during the Seder, it's broken open, sliced, given to each one at the table, and then dipped into salt water, which represents what? It's right, tears. But it's not only a token of grief, it's also a symbol of new life. And then the last item on the Seder plate, and probably the strangest one of all, is this one called the Zeroa. It's a shank bone of a lamb. Passover is also known as a feast of the Passover lamb, and yet a Passover lamb isn't eaten. You see, the lambs that used to be served at Passover were the Passover sacrifices. But in 70 AD, the temple was destroyed in Jerusalem, and so was the altar where those sacrifices were performed. So from that time to this day, no sacrifices are made, and so lamb isn't eaten at Passover. Now, the presence of these two elements, the egg and the shank bone, raises a very interesting question. With no temple, no altar, no sacrifice, how is it possible to atone for our sins? For the law of Moses states very clearly for I have given to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it's the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. Well, some people, both Jewish and Gentile, might say, perhaps that was important 2,000 years ago. But that has no bearing on our lives today, does it? Doesn't it? If not, then why does the Haggadah instruct us to take the story of Passover personally? is though each one of us were being brought out of the land of Egypt. I think we're supposed to take the story of redemption personally because each one of us needs to be redeemed. But with no sacrifice, how is redemption possible? With no Lamb of God, how? Well, once, nearly 2,000 years ago, there lived a Jewish man by the name of Yochanan. You might know him better as John, John the Baptist. And one day... <clears throat> While he was baptizing people in the River Jordan, his gaze fell upon the form of another man, and he declared, 
Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's how. Not through the sacrifice of Passover lambs, but by the sacrifice of the Passover lamb, the Lamb of God. It's now time for the second cup, the cup of plagues. And in Jewish tradition, a full cup represents complete joy. But in one sense, our joy isn't complete. At this point in the Seder, we would pour out some of the contents of this cup as we remember the plagues which were poured out upon the Egyptians. We mourn their loss and express sorrow over their destruction. There's an important lesson in this cup. Pharaoh defied the will of God. He was repeatedly told what God wanted him to do, but his heart was hardened, and he said, no, I refuse, I will not. And as a result, he brought death and destruction, not only upon his land, but into his own home. His firstborn son died because of his hardness of heart. How often do we choose our desires over God's direction? How often do we know God's will for our lives? But how often do we say, no, I refuse, I will not? Well, let me give you a little piece of Jewish wisdom. If God's telling you to do something, do it. The cup of plagues. But as I've said, Passover is a night of rejoicing, a night of thanksgiving, and a night to praise God. And tonight, I can praise God, not only because the angel of death passed over our ancestors' homes, and not only because the Lord redeemed us out of the land of Egypt, but because I've been born, uh, redeemed by another lamb, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, Messiah Jesus. It's through him that I've passed over from death to life. Now, at this point in the Seder, we're not done yet, but the table would be cleared off and the traditional Passover meal would be served. We'd eat such Jewish delicacies as matzo ball soup, gefilte fish, chopped liver. Now, hold back your excitement. I can't stand all the drooling. <clears throat> I already said I'm not going to serve it to you, okay? But what I'd like to do is I'd like to whet your appetite with some information about the work of Jews for Jesus. When you came in, you should have received one of these Christ in the Passover brochures. You'll notice that form that you tore off a minute ago. It's our way of sending you our free newsletter. And you may be wondering, well, you know, why should I get the newsletter? And I have a couple of reasons for that. First is because we want to help you to be more effective in reaching out to those Jewish people that you know with the gospel. And I'm curious how many of you know somebody that's Jewish? few of you, great. And you know, there's an old saying that goes like this. If you can witness to a Jewish person, you can witness to anybody, okay? So our newsletter will be very helpful in that way. But the other reason that I want you to get it, I have to confess, I'm selfish, and I want you to be praying for our ministry. And you know, our newsletter shares what I do as a full-time missionary. Yesterday, I celebrated my 33rd anniversary with Jews for Jesus. So, um, <clears throat> and you know, one of the things I do a lot of Praise God, praise God. Um, one of the things I do a lot of is I visit with Jewish people on a one-to-one -one basis to witness to them as well as to disciple and encourage Jewish believers in their faith. Um, and just recently, uh, there's a fellow I started meeting with. Um, he had a, a friend of his, a believing friend of his, had left a message for us uh, to follow up with this fellow David. And David is Jewish, and he wasn't a believer, and he lives in Florida. And so I reached out to him. I gave him a call, and we had a really great conversation. I asked him if he'd be open to looking at Messianic prophecy and all of that, maybe to Zoom, you know, meet by Zoom sometime. And we started meeting, and I think it was after the first or the second visit that we had. We've been meeting on a weekly basis ever since. But David gave his life to the Lord. And, um, you know, and I praise the Lord for that. Now I'm discipling him. We're going through the Gospel of John. And uh, so I do a lot of that. Also, we have what we call live chat at our website, and I do a lot of that as well. It's kind of like if you have problems with a bill that you get, like a utilities bill, and you go online, try to get it fixed, and there's a pop-up window, you know, can we help you? Well, we're doing that at our website too, and I do a lot of that. And you'd be surprised how many Jewish people 
come into that website because you can be anonymous, you know, you can check, you know, resources out, you can research, and nobody has to know, right? So recently I chatted with a, a woman by the name of Sharon who lives in Southern California, and I found out she was 70, she's 75 years old, really sharp. I mean, if she can chat on the internet, 75 is not, you know, is not, she's not a slouch. So anyway, <clears throat> we chatted a little bit, and I found that she seemed to be open to the gospel. So I said, would you mind if I gave you a call sometime? Maybe we can talk and I can answer your questions. So Sharon and I started to meet. I found out that um, she's Jewish, of course, I knew that, that her son, her adult son, is a Jewish believer, and so is uh, his wife. She's a believer as well. And what I found out was they've been saying to her, you need to receive Jesus. You need to believe in him as a Messiah. And she kind of believed in him knowledge-wise, and she used to pray even to him when she needed things or whatever. Well, we started meeting on a regular basis, and um, we're going through the Gospel of John right now. And so um, she said she, basically she's sitting on the fence because she's afraid she might lose her Jewish identity if she commits a life to Jesus. So I just ask that you pray for Sharon, for her to come to faith, and for David for his growth. And then one other thing I do quite a bit of, I take part in some Jewish classes, and we call that our ministry's Jewish Immersion Initiative. We want to get involved with our Jewish community. And so I take classes these days, it's more online. One of them is a Torah class, a Torah study from a synagogue, um, and another class from a Jewish community center called Life. It's complicated. How do you like that title, right? Don't we know it, right? <clears throat> and the, both rabbis know that I'm a Jewish believer, but that's fine. We've talked, and um, I've gotten to share individually with a number of people in that, in that way also. So the reason I tell you all that is because I want you to get the newsletter so you can know how to pray for our ministry effectively. And then another way to be involved today is by giving toward our work. And, um, you know, the money goes towards evangelism, as you've heard already. But I want to tell you there are two reasons not to give to Jews for Jesus today. The first is we believe you should be tithing to this church or your home church first. And then the other reason for not giving is that if you're here or you're watching online and you're not yet a believer in Jesus, well, guess what? God's got something he wants to give to you first, and that's the gift of eternal life in him. So having said all of that, there are various ways to give, and later on, at the very end, uh, Sandy and I will be in the back at the kiosk and stuff, and you can come, you can bring your filled out cards just to get our newsletter, even if you choose not to give today for whatever reason. Um, but anyway, I invite you to join us in the work of Jews for Jesus. And after the meal, we come the third cup, the cup of redemption. And as I already said, this cup is a focal point of the entire service. But the ceremony cannot proceed just yet because something is still missing. Earlier, something was broken, buried, and now it needs to be brought back. Now, does anybody remember what it's called? Somebody said over there, it's a Greek word, afikomen, right? And all the children search for the afikomen, <clears throat> but only one will discover where it's been hidden. And once it's found, it's returned to the head of the house and then broken again. Each person receives a piece of the afikomen about the size of an olive. And this olive-sized piece is taken along with the third cup, the cup of redemption. Does this sound familiar? Well, it should, for this is the origin of our communion service. But not only that, consider this. Where else do we find a clearer picture of our Messiah Jesus than in this custom concerning the Afi Komen, which was broken, buried, and then brought back? Even the matzah, which is unleavened, a symbol of a sinless nature, speaks of Jesus. Our rabbis have set down very specific regulations concerning the appearance of matzah, if it's to be found suitable for use. In the first place, it must be striped. Jesus was striped. And as the prophet Isaiah foretold, and with the stripes, we're healed. And in the second place, it must be pierced. 
Maybe you can see the pierce marks. Jesus was pierced, and as the prophet Zechariah foretold, they shall look upon me whom they've pierced. But I can say I'm assigned not only in the Afi Komen, but in the Matzatash as well. Do you remember this pouch containing the three layers of unleavened bread from which the Afi Komen is drawn? There's quite a bit of disagreement among our rabbis as to the meaning of this pouch, this mysterious three-in-one. Some teach that the Matzatash represents the three patriarchs of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But why is the middle matzah broken, buried, and then brought back? And then there are others who say that the matzah represents the three divisions of worship in our ancient kingdom, the priests, the Levites, and the people of Israel. But why is the middle matzah broken, buried, and then brought back? And then there's still others who teach that the matzatash represents three crowns, the crown of learning, the crown of priesthood, and the crown of kingship. But why is the middle matzah broken, buried, and then brought back? It is a known. And none of these explanations offers a satisfactory answer. But why search for explanations? Why not just accept the answer so clearly suggested in the very design of the matzatash itself? For there are three layers here, and yet they form a unity a triunity, a trinity. And a Hebrew word for such a unity is the word echad. And it brings to my mind the words of God spoken through Moses, who declared, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. But the word used for one here is the word echad, which may mean a unity. And so every year at Passover, the head of the house removes the middle layer of this unity, this echad. It's made visible while the other two remain hidden from our view. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And he came unto his own, but his own received him not. But to as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe on his name. We Jews who know the Messiah know also that the unity of the Matzatash bears witness to the unity of one God revealed in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Why is the middle matzah broken, buried, and then brought back? I think because Jesus was broken, buried, and then brought back. This is my body which is given for you and you, and you, and all of us. Do this in remembrance of me. And now it's time for the third cup, the cup of redemption. The fruit of the vine at Passover is usually read, our rabbis teach, to remind us of the precious blood of the first Passover lambs that were sacrificed in order to buy us back, to redeem us from bondage and slavery to Pharaoh. But in the same way, the blood of another Passover lamb the Messiah, Jesus, was sacrificed in order to buy us back, to redeem us from bondage and slavery to sin. And it was concerning this cup, the cup of redemption, the cup taken after the meal, that our Messiah, Jesus, said, this cup which is poured out for you is a new covenant in my blood, a very new covenant promised to us by God through the prophet Jeremiah when he declared, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with your fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them. But this is a covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days I will put my law within them and upon their hearts will I write it. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. The broken piece of Afi Komen and the cup of redemption are taken together in remembrance of the body and blood of the Passover lamb. My Passover lamb is Jesus. And then we come to the fourth cup, the cup of Hallel, or the cup of praise. Now, I know that many of you know a Hebrew word, 
But I wonder if you know that it's Hebrew. It's the word hallelujah, which means praise the Lord. But the first part of that word is the word hallel, or praise. And this is a cup of hallel, or the cup of praise. And we have much to praise the Lord for, don't we? But there's one final cup from which no one drinks. This is a cup of Elijah. And in many, many households, a complete place setting is left untouched, all for the prophet Elijah. Why? Why this longing for the prophet Elijah? Well, it's recorded by the Hebrew prophet Malachi that before the Messiah comes, he be preceded by the return of Elijah the prophet, Eliyahu Hanat V. And so every year at Passover, a young child will go to the front door, he'll open it wide, hoping the prophet will accept the invitation, come into the home, and announce the coming of the Messiah. I know that Eliyahu, Elijah has returned. For when Jesus spoke of the prophet John the Baptist, he said of him, if you care to accept it, he himself is Elijah who was to come. The prophet, the forerunner, has come. And so has the Messiah. Let's bow forward to prayer. Father, we praise you and we thank you that while we were still sinners, you sent Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, to die for us. We thank you, Father, for your plan of salvation that you laid out for us throughout the scriptures so that all of us today are here without excuse, and we know it, Lord. I pray, Father, for those who may be here this morning or are watching that have not yet trusted in the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, your Son, Jesus, that even today they might commit themselves to you, Father. And I pray for those who already know you and are perhaps not walking closely with you, that you would draw them back to yourself. Lord, we praise you and we thank you for all of this and for this time. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen.